Kicking off the list at number 10, Black Widow and Bruce Banner. Okay, remember in Age of Ultron when Black Widow was the key to calming Banner down? They were in love, right? I mean, I think. I mean, they were flirting at the beginning of the movie, and then even Steve Rogers was like, hey, you're not breaking any bylaws, haha, -ha, no sweat, brother. Like, it's a thing, it's happening. And then they're at Clint's secret little family farmhouse talking about running away together. And then after all of this, when Bruce returns to Earth, he says hi to Nat, and then she's like, hi, Bruce, that's kind of it. Weird. Well, according to Infinity War co-screenwriter Stephen McFeely, he said they certainly tried to make this happen. We have scenes, we wrote them, we shot them, of the two of them cashing it out. You've been gone, I've moved on, that kind of stuff. It became very clear that it was a scene that was not really essential to the plot. It couldn't survive Infinity War. That thing has to be on rails just to get to the finish line. Couldn't wrap up loose threads just because you wanted to. I mean, that's fair, that's a good call. But I feel like Endgame, we could have spiced it up a little bit, no? I mean, Black Widow dies and Bruce like throws a bench, maybe like 90 yards. It's not even that big of a throw. I'd throw uh, a fit. I'd throw a fit if Scarlett Johansson was my girlfriend and she died. I'd throw a big fit. And before we go on to number nine, guys, if you could go ahead and give us a like down below, the thumbs up right there because it really helps us out here at our studio you guys rock number nine hulk and company okay for this one we go to ultimate wolverine versus hulk so wolverine at this point is a little occupied okay he's on the way to take out the jolly green giant so he heads to a tibian town he's tracking him he's using his sense and then finally he gets his sights on him and let's just say it's a sight you wouldn't forget yeah he walks in on hulk with not one not two but like 40 women. Hi Bruce, he says before popping out his claws. It's crazy Wolverine tracked him down by sniffing. I feel like he got to that door and was like, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna come back later. That's, something, something's wrong in there. Something's not, something's not nice in there. Number eight, She-Hulk and Star Fox. Of course, I have to throw this one in the mix. So Eros, AKA Star Fox, has this really messed up ability where he can make anybody he comes in contact with fall in love. Like Cupid, but with more yuck. Yeah, he even has the face of somebody who does weird like that. He looks like every Brad I've ever met. So the two of them hook up and Jen even talked about how it was a great time. Okay. Cut to She-Hulk issue six. Jen is defending Star Fox in a assault case. And the question is, will this affect his Avengers status? Like, yes, most definitely. That's usually how this works. So Jen got to thinking, although she made the first move, did he make it happen? But all ended up being consensual and Eero's love touch powers were deactivated. Probably for the better because well, I'll get into that a little bit later on. Number seven, She-Hulk and Juggernaut. Shifting over now to Uncanny X-Men 435, The Trial of Juggernaut. It's standard professional practice to not hook up with your clients. I mean, I think, especially if that client is a big bad. So Jennifer Walters at this point was representing Juggernaut. And then in a moment of heroic actions, Juggernaut kind of proves he's not all bad. He doesn't like save a cat out of a tree or anything remarkable. He just decides not to kill a guard. So Jen Walters is like, huh, interesting. Is this a scam? I wonder, why didn't you escape? He's like, I don't know, man. My dad was a rocket scientist. I've always been a failure. Women's rights are the best. I'm a huge Jets fan. That's literally how it goes. And then Jen's like, oh, and it gets her attention because in the next page, the room is a goddamn mess. The bed has broken into the ground. The lamp is busted. And guys, worst of all, worst of all, the windows are wide open. They didn't even try and close the curtains a foot. There's like nothing. It's just all glass. Freaks, you're freaks. Number six. Hulk and She-Hulk. I'll be honest, I was gonna save this one for number one on the list, but I didn't want this video to end and then have you guys sitting there like, gross. So in the old man Logan storyline, it gets a little, ew. We have this gang, the Hulk gang. Yeah, sounds pretty sick, right? They go around bashing people in who don't pay rent. Hell, if that was a Disney Plus show that was announced, I'd be so pumped. Oh wait, Hulk gang is the result of She-Hulk and the Hulk having kids together? I feel like I've said enough already, so now allow me to show you enough. Yep, yuck that, no way. Number five, Hercules and She-Hulk. She's had a crush on Hercules for a while, I mean, I feel like most of us did growing up, no? He looks similar to Star Fox, so clearly she's got a type. In She-Hulk issue 30, it opens with this shot. She's expressing how if she's gonna fall off the wagon, it could be worse than having it be with Hercules. I mean, fair. But how does something like this actually come to fruition? Well, she mentioned falling off the wagon, but the only wagon that's falling is Hercules' wagon right into the palm of her hand. That's right, a move she picked up from the X-Men, she straight up grabs Hercules by his bum bum and then just hucks him at their giant size enemy, which is a great power move, something we almost saw last year in Endgame, actually. Yeah, Ant-Man was gonna throw the Hulk, who's gonna throw Sp 
Spider-Man. And then he would have probably died. That's a lot of power. So this plus taking down an enemy together, things are heating up. There's a lot of chemistry, a lot of chemistry. After all, once you use somebody's assets like that, the rest kind of makes sense. I mean, maybe not in an RV in a parking lot, but hey, I'm not judging, I'm not judging. Number four, She-Hulk and Tony Stark. I mean, it was only a matter of time before these two crossed paths and did the dirty. So they're both known for their crazy hookups. And then in She-Hulk issue 17, we see it go down, but it's different, okay? So Tony at this time is the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Jen Walters at this point was an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. So it all starts with a debriefing, of course, a debriefing. Now, was the debriefing professional in any manner? Do we have PowerPoints and laser pointers? No, no we didn't. No, 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 Tony gets a candlelit dinner aboard the helicarrier. Even Clay Quarterman's like, hey, maybe I should debrief her. I don't know, just a thought. Get out of here, perv. The issue is interesting because like I said, they're both known to be the soups who get around town, but Tony gets treated like this cool playboy dude. They're like, yeah, keep doing it, man. Keep getting those girls. And then She-Hulk gets all the shame. The double standards here are nuts. So while they're about to open this conversation up, Tony starts to say, well, Jen, try looking at it from this angle. Bam, evil attacks in the form of robots. And they're not even out of bed yet. Great timing. She-Hulk's like, yeah, don't take this the wrong way, but you should definitely get dressed right now. It would have been a good conversation too. She-Hulk would have told them exactly what's up and the readers would have been like, okay, heard, fair. Number three. Kyra and the Hulk. Planet Hulk is a great run. We have this savage alien planet, barbarian tribes, Kind of like gladiator vibes, it's great. And when it comes to love, it's still in the air, just this time around, it's a bit more of a duty rather than a passion. So we find Kyra Old Strong and the two hit it off, like really quickly. Hulk comes out and asks her to be his queen, just like that, let's do it. Sure, Game of Thrones style, all right. Our guy doesn't waste any time, we'd love to see it. Then their wedding, I mean, <clears throat> shadow ceremony happens and out comes two kids. After her death, yeah, she gave birth to Scar and his evil other half like in secret, Hero Kala. I wish we saw this unfold on Sakaar in the MCU. I feel like Ragnarok should have been a touch darker. All right, it was too fun. It was too fun. Sue me. I don't know. Number two, She-Hulk and Man-Wolf. The son of J. Jonah Jameson, John Jameson, a lot of J's in there, got married to She-Hulk. Yeah, it was during the Civil War where the two had been dating and then decided to take it up a notch in the terms of holy matrimony. She loved him so much, she would purposely try and stay in her human form because Man-Wolf preferred that. Gotta love controlling relationships. Huh. Sounds lovely, but this is a weird romance list, so there's more to it than just that. See, Man-Wolf and She-Hulk had a rocky relationship, so when they got married, it was kind of weird. You're like, do they love each other? Is this kind of, he's really controlling and he's weird. Well, it turns out their love wasn't so natural after all. Star Fox, that weirdo that I mentioned earlier in this list, he was using his powers, his love powers, to make them love each other. So it was never really authentic. It's all a sham. So when she finds out, not only is she hurt and heartbroken, but she quickly slides over those divorce papers and Manwolf and her go separate ways. But it wasn't easy for Manwolf. I mean, Jen Walters is a catch. I'd be pretty upset too. I'd be like crying and signing. Tears would be dripping onto the paper. Oops, gotta get another one. And finally, number one, Hawkeye and She-Hulk. Okay, with all these new Disney shows being announced, there's like 50 of them, I swear. One of them that I'm most excited for is the animated What If series. There's a lot of fun and a lot of weird in these comics. Like volume two, issue 114, for example, we see Jen Walters and Hawkeye have a kid. Yeah, they name him CJ, a little Clint Jr. He shares both skills of his parents, that of being green and lean, while also knowing how to shoot an arrow. It's a great combo. You're gonna get a lot of done. You're gonna kill it at birthday parties. This all happens when the Beyonders assemble heroes and villains to scrap it out during the events of Secret Wars on Battleworld. But what if they never left after they settled the truce? Although we don't see the two in their awkward flirting, what's your favorite color? Stages, they seem to hit it off really quite well. I love the what if stuff. I mean, Captain America and Rogue, I mean, that alone is just, there's a lot of crazy in there. Number 10, Captain Marvel. I can't deny, I actually kind of like this ship, but it still feels pretty out of left field, especially if you're more of a cinematic Marvel fan, and that's where a lot of your knowledge comes from. And even if you're not, while there has been quite a bit of flirting between the two in the comics, I would have never expected either hero to actually act on those flirtations and possible feelings. Anyways, Carol basically had a bit of a crush on Spidey, which has come up multiple times in the past, and both were close friends due to their time working side by side on the Avengers. While Carol herself tends to be a bit more serious and 
Peter is a bit more silly. The two have some pretty adorable interactions, and they also have a lot of strong mutual respect, which is what it's all about when it comes to romance, baby. They went on a date back when Carol was still operating under her Miss Marvel mantle, but her crush has also come up a few times since then. Spider Man bartered to get that initial date with her in exchange for basically his superhero help. The date was awkward, but it ended on a not so bad note when both heroes kind of realized they were just working way too hard to impress the other person instead of just being themselves. Which is also what romance should be all about, just being yourselves. Also, I like that I did this when I was talking about people having mutual respect. Like, this is fighting. I don't know why I did this, but you know, mutual respect. So we did see them go on that one date, however, we have not seen them date since. Even though it went pretty well by the end of it. Number 9. Deadpool. Okay, so this one isn't an official romance, more of a, a bromance, but it's shipped enough by people that we could consider it a fan based pseudo romance, which, yeah, is a thing I just made up now, so that's a thing now. Fan based pseudo romances, that's a term. Basically, Deadpool is borderline in love and obsessed with Spider Man. It's pretty one sided for the most part, but the two do have their moments, and there are times when Deadpool even inspires Spider Man. Or at least makes Peter consider Deadpool's maybe not as terrible and as annoying as he originally thought. The two have helped each other out multiple times and even have a whole team up series together, and it lasted three years. It's pretty romantic. Number 8, Mary Jane Watson. For this Spider Man, we're not talking about Peter Parker, obviously. I'm not trying to argue that their relationship is weird, because, you know, it's been going on for a long time. Although, at times, that relationship between Peter Parker and MJ definitely can be weird, I would argue. I'm actually talking about here the relationship between the Scarlet Spider and Mary Jane Watson, Ben Riley, who for a time was also known as Spider Man. While we don't actually see how their romance plays out in the alternate world belonging to Universe X, it is implied that the two had a daughter together there who grows up to become Spider Girl. It's never explained how this came about, but the idea of Mary Jane ending up and settling down with Ben Riley makes me wonder what happened to Peter in this alternate universe. Or is it possible that initially Mary Jane thought this was Peter, with Ben being himself a clone of Parker? I have so many questions. Number 7, Ultimate Katie Bishop. This weird romance belongs to the Spider Man known as Miles Morales. What's the deal with this relationship? Well, in the Ultimate Universe of 16, Kate Bishop is not like the one we have in Earth 616. She isn't Hawkeye's apprentice, nor does she become Hawkeye in this reality. Instead, we learn she is dating Miles Morales and is just a, a normal student. Or so it seems. In reality, her parents are Hydra agents who sedate Miles when he visits and then kidnap him and experiment on him, alongside Doctor Doom. Ultimate Doctor Doom. Fortunately, he does manage to escape and, of course, decides to break up with Katie before leaving. Gotta love those extreme ultimate romances. So weird. I also like that Miles was like, Yeah, so you guys like kidnapped me and experimented on me, so I think I'm just gonna like break up. I think I'm just gonna break up with you, but this was weird. Thanks. <laughs> It's like a weird way to end your relationship. Number 6, Jackpot. With Jackpot, it's all pretty confusing because we have Sarah Earhart, the real superpowered Jackpot, and Alana Jobson, who is posing as Jackpot and uses drugs to give herself powers so she can become a hero. Here we are mostly talking about Alana Jobson. Alana Jobson, who is posing as Jackpot. While Alana herself is implied as being attracted to Sarah, when posing as Jackpot and fighting alongside Spider Man, he initially thinks that she might be his ex girlfriend, Mary Jane. The two of them have a few flirty moments while fighting together. Jackpot even calls him Tiger, considering the name of her character is obviously meant to be a play on Mary Jane's famous catchphrase, You just hit the jackpot, Tiger. This is also what compels Spider Man to want to learn more about the new superhero. In reality, Alana Jobson is paying Sarah to use her superhero identity and registration papers. Because she just really wants to be a hero. She ends up dying as a result of this desire when the superpower inducing drugs and hormones she uses together end up killing her when mixed with a blindness serum, despite Spider Man successfully giving her the antidote to said serum. This romance never really goes anywhere, it just ends in tragedy. Number 6, Emma Frost. This one is pretty strange, but it's also coming at us from an alternate reality, so you know, you kinda just gotta go with it. I think what really shocked me about it though is that Kitty Pride and Peter Parker were also known to date in the Ultimate Universe, and so I've always kinda thought of Kitty as being, you know, quite younger than Emma, and that was the thing that made me go like, wait, what? So how old? What's happening? 
So I was just confused in general by that logic, although this is comic. So while in some realities characters may have a greater age gap in others, they may actually be the exact same age, closing that gap completely. And in this comic, that is what is happening. In Marvel Adventures Spider-Man, which takes place in the alternate reality of Earth 20051, both Emma Frost and her BFF Shat Sand Duval had a crush on Spidey, and Emma Frost is the same age as him here, so it's not weird. It's not, it's a little weird, but it's not weird. Emma being a telepath used her powers to uncover his secret identity and she causes a bit of trouble when Chad and Peter start dating. Eventually her trickery however is exposed and she's forced to face the consequences of her actions. Here Emma Frost is known by the code name Silencer and ends up becoming an ally to both Chad and Spider-Man later on. Number 4. Black Widow the strange thing is, while this happened in Marvel Team Up issue number 82, as a quick little thing, when Black Widow loses her memory temporarily, it also has been a comic ship in an alternate world where there is an amalgam alternate version of Black Widow who is basically a blend of both Black Widow and Black Cat, which yes, is one of the coolest alternates for both Black Cat and Black Widow. I know, it's pretty great. The issue where these two, however, initially hook up comes to us from way, way back before that. How it ends up happening is Spider Man saves the day for Black Widow, who at the time believes she is a school teacher named Nancy Rushman. The other weird thing is that Natasha has also lost her memories of who she is, but has managed to retain her fighting know how and also assist Spider Man with apprehending criminals, not thinking that it is weird at all for her to be doing. But, you know, I guess the fighting know how maybe is in her physical memory? I, I don't know how that. That all works, but brains, stuff, wiring, physical memory? Spider Man recognizes her and recognizes that her being enamored with him is admittedly pretty weird, as is the fact that she thinks she is a woman named Nancy Rushman when she's not. Once her memories are back, Black Widow is over the flirtation and basically just dips at the end of the issue. She's like, this was cool, but also not into you. Bye. Only me as Nancy Rushman was into you, Spider Man. Sorry about that. Number three, Spider Woman. While this isn't an official thing that has happened as of yet, we have gotten quite a few flirty moments between Spider Man and Jessica Drew from Brian Michael Bendis' run on The Avengers. They weren't full on shipped, but there was definitely some suggestive light shipping happening there. At one point when they are teamed up, Jessica even scans Spider Man to make sure he's not a scroll, just because she finds him to be so strange. His response was to ask if they were on a date. I guess he's just used to women calling him weird on dates, which kind of makes sense because Peter Parker is pretty awkward and weird. Fair enough. Number 2. Silk One of the strangest romances that Peter has ever had is with another one of the spider folks, Silk, Cindy Moon. Apparently they were both bit by the same radioactive spider, which is why they believe they are so irresistibly infatuated with one another. Either that or they just are inexplicably attracted to each other. The whole fact that they don't seem to have control of their physical urge to be together makes this relationship one of the weirdest that Peter has ever had, and kind of one of the most uncomfortable in my opinion, especially as even when they're in danger, they just feel the urge to like just get physical instead of you know dealing with the, the problem at hand. Like their attraction to one another not only seems to be completely uncontrollable, but it can also potentially endanger innocent lives or their own lives, even. Number one, Marrow. Yep, probably one of the weirdest relationships that's happened out there for Peter Parker. There was a random time that he briefly dated Marrow. Why? Well, I don't know, because comics. These two dated very briefly and even had a team up one shot titled Spider Man Marrow in the early 2000s, which delved into their brief relationship and Marrow's change in personality. Their relationship ended after Marrow realized she wasn't really herself, as she was being brainwashed and used by S.H.I.E.L.D. to hunt down life model decoys. After she regained her memories, she escaped S.H.I.E.L.D., but the two ultimately broke up because. Yeah, I mean she hadn't quite been herself basically throughout their relationship, so that'll do it. Oh, also she was a student at ESU where Peter was guest lecturing as a grad student, and Sarah refers to him multiple times in this issue as Mr. Parker, which I cannot deny, I found quite a bit creepy. If you're calling your partner Mr. something, I don't know about that. Seems weird. 
Maybe that's just me. Number 10, Candace Nelson. That time when Daredevil very briefly dated Foggy Nelson's sister. Oh yeah, Foggy has a sister. Apparently, this happened so quickly, it's basically the smallest blip on Daredevil's love line, I'm sure, when it comes to palm ratings. Candace is Foggy Nelson's younger sister who is studying journalism at ESU and ended up doing some snooping and attempted to expose the government and university for some involvement in some super shady activity. She and Foggy have always been at odds because she sees him as the way too stiff establishment type and he sees her as the rebel who thinks that she's above the law. In the end, she and Daredevil had a bit of a thing at a time when Daredevil was pretty much wanted by every woman who appeared in his comic, including Natasha Romanoff, Black Widow. Oh, and after years of being friends with Foggy, Matt didn't even know that he had a sister till we got past the hundredth issue of Daredevil, which is pretty weird. It's also implied later on that she is way too young for Matt. Also her face is something else in that whole issue where that comes up. She's like, I missed you. And I'm like, what's going on? You look crazy, Candace. Number nine, Electra. While Electra may be one of Daredevil's greatest loves, it doesn't mean she can't be one of the strangest as well. It all boils down to the fact that Electra is a really intense anti-hero when she's not busy being a villain. She's an assassin who has zero qualms with killing anyone in her way, which makes those two a kind of strange match. However, their costumes match really well, which is likely meant to symbolize some of the similarities that these two have. They are both intensely skilled fighters with a lot of darkness in their past and their present, to be honest. <laughs> Her present. Well, yeah, because Electra did come back to life, so it did happen. She has a present, even though she did. However, Electra kind of paved the way for all the death and destruction, it seems, that dating Daredevil seems to bring to most of his partners. So there's also that. Number eight, Becky Blake. This is a pretty weird one, mostly just because it seems like Becky Blake and Matt's relationship is a very one sided and has always remained that way, and yet Becky never gives up. But also because Becky is another character who has just suffered a lot of trauma and tragedy, some of which was caused by Matt Murdock himself, and some of which was not. While many people might know Karen Page as the sole secretary for Nelson and Murdock, after there was Karen, there was Becky. Becky herself lost the use of her legs after suffering an attack by Michael Reese, who Murdock would later bring to justice. Becky would consistently express her feelings for Matt, who seemed conflicted, before deciding he wasn't interested. Maybe it was his relationship with Karen, which was also a huge mess, that ultimately affected his decision. Either way, Karen remained a friend to Matt for a long time despite all the crazy stuff he put her through. In fact, she even also became a lawyer and joined their firm for a while. Eventually, however, she chose to firmly distance herself from both Matt and Foggy after having a near-death experience and felt that Matt Murdock was no longer worthy of her trust. And she was like desperate for him for so long and I'm just like, wow, that one thing though, she's like, and that's it. I was super into you, but I can't anymore. Number seven, Moon Dragon. Yeah, this was a weird one, a brief one. But a weird one. Daredevil and Moondragon had a brief infatuation with one another in Daredevil issue 108. After he leaves Natasha Black Widow, who also has the hots for him, she mourns the loss of Matt, knowing that he has eyes for Moondragon. What? Okay, so even if we ignore the fact that Moondragon is usually presented later as being a gay character in the comics, this is still a really weird ship. The two are described as being inexplicably drawn to one another, but ultimately decide to go their separate ways because they are galaxies apart. Well, literally. I also love that Moondragon originally explains that they can't be together because of their respective orientations toward life in the cosmos, apparently. They also, I believe, one time like psychically mind melded, which is uh, pretty sexy for Moondragon, I think. She's like, mm, let me get into that beautiful, brilliant mind. Number six, Dakota North. I mean, this one made sense in terms of how it kind of came about, and it wasn't a full on romance specifically, but these two did hook up. It all went down after Matt had suffered a pretty big loss and was still technically married. After the hookup, the not so great part was that pictures of these two doing the deed were circulated, because Kingpin is obsessed in every way possible you can imagine with Daredevil. They ended up on the front page of all the newspapers, which was super awkward for both Dakota and Matt, and also for a time cost Dakota North pretty unfairly, if I might add, her reputation. Matt came out mostly unscathed though in comparison, although there was definitely a cost for him as well when it came to these pictures. The images made everything super weird between the two going forward. And kind of awkward for I think a lot of people in that comic. There were a lot of people that were like, ah! What's happening? Number five, Karen Page. Karen Page has to have one of the most tragic stories out of all of Daredevil's love interests. One of, anyways, 
because as I said earlier, there's a lot of tragedy here. Karen and Matt had an on and off again romance that eventually resulted in Karen's death at the hands of Bullseye. Surprise, surprise. Karen betrayed Matt by selling out his secret identity due to a drug addiction. However, she did return to warn him afterward. In the end, Matt and Karen came back together despite the revelation that she had been the one to sell out his secret identity in this case and had betrayed him. She got clean and the two of them got back together. They would later break up again and get back together a few more times, with Karen even forgiving Daredevil for faking his death and helping him when he had a crisis where split personalities appeared to emerge. Which kind of makes sense given his dating history, but we'll get to that later. They had the most rocky romance likely in comic book history overall, and Karen actually gave her life to save Daredevil. But also she went through some crazy stuff, I feel like because of Daredevil. Ah! Poor Karen Page. RIP. Number 4. Mila Donovan There are fates worse than death, and that seems to be what Mila Donovan got when it comes to her relationship with Daredevil. She was driven insane by Mr. Fear, who had been targeting her for months and posing as her therapist after she ended up marrying Matt Murdock. She was driven insane, killed someone as a result, and ended up being locked away for her own good when private care also wasn't working for her. In the end, her husband Matt was denied visitation rights while Mila was in treatment, as it was believed that he was actually the cause of all of her problems. Yikes. Her parents attempted to get custody of Mila again after they learned of everything that had happened to their daughter and blamed Matt. Which is, I mean, it's kind of fair to be honest. In the end, Matt agreed to their request after pictures of him sleeping with Dakota North surfaced. Overall, he was just going through a lot and he needed a shoulder to cry on, which ended up turning into a weird relationship with Dakota, which we talked about earlier. Matt had been attempting to lobby to get Mila freed from the mental institution, but in the end, he acknowledged that he just needed to let her go. Bullseye did attempt to kill her when she was made one of his targets, but fortunately, Daredevil had already predicted this play and had Black Widow on standby to protect Mila. All in all, this relationship became all kinds of messed up, and I'm still amazed that Mila is alive today. And before we move on to our number three spot, just a quick little reminder to give this video a thumbs up if you can, if you will. It really does help us out here at the channel, and thank you for doing so. Number three, Heather Glenn. Heather Glenn is another weird partner for Daredevil in that her story was also deeply tragic. Hmm, I guess this is becoming no longer weird since everybody's story is deeply tragic. She was a beneficiary of his, a wealthy socialite that he ended up dating. In his Daredevil guise, he ended up saving her father from Purple Man, Kilgrave, who had been controlling him. However, her father was so distraught when he found out all that the purple man had made him do that he still took his own life while he was in prison. In the end, his daughter would follow suit. She blamed Daredevil for her father's death and attempted to betray his secret identity multiple times to get back at him. Still, somehow, Matt got past that and Heather got past her own hatred of Dee Dee, and the two ended up engaged. In the end, however, Heather took her own life, hanging herself after she became distraught when criminals destroyed her business. Which, of course, she also blamed Daredevil for. And which, he once again, may have deserved that blame. Maybe. Number two, Black Cat. This is a pretty random one. Black Cat isn't someone you'd associate with Daredevil, mostly because she is usually so obsessed with Spider Man that everyone she has ever been with outside of Peter Parker tends to have to do with some kind of play of getting back at him or something to do with Peter himself. For Black Cat, it's usually all about Spider Man. So, how did this come about? Well, it all went down when Spider Man recruited Daredevil to help him free Black Cat from prison. But while they were developing a legal strategy, Black Cat herself escaped and the two of them had to track her down. It was during this time that Daredevil developed an attraction to Black Cat and she to him. Although for Black Cat, there still really only seems to be one true superhero for her, as both she and Daredevil admitted that their relationship was more of a fun physical thing than anything serious. Although I guess I'm not super surprised that they're attracted to each other because they're both like hotties, but I'm also just like, this is like a random thing that someone was like, what if they got together? And I was like, I mean, I guess, why not? Number one, Typhoid Mary. Typhoid Mary has got to be one of the strangest pairings for Matt, especially considering he was the one that caused all the grief in her life after he knocked her out of a window. True story. This trauma brought forth from Mary three split personalities, at least three, which are later kind of explained as being part of past trauma, but were kind of just triggered into resurfacing by Matt's accidental influence. 
by his accidental violence, really. Still, you can pretty much blame Matt for creating the villain that became Typhoid Mary. One of these personalities was that villain, another was hypersexual, and the third was much more modest in comparison to the other two. I guess the most normal of all three personalities, really. These are the most commonly acknowledged personalities, but she also appears to have other lesser utilized personalities when it comes to the comics, such as Mutant Zero. Daredevil for a time was involved with all three of her main personalities, but it gets weirder. A frequent ally of the Kingpin, Mary has also attempted to kill Matt multiple times. Oh, and while she is a mutant, she only seems to be able to access her mutant abilities through certain personalities. Weird. Number 10, Venom and Clint Barton. Things get pretty weirdly kinky with these two characters in the New Avengers Annual issue number 3 from 2009. Here we see what happens to Clint after he goes after Norman Osborn's Dark Avengers. He is being held as a prisoner and is being interrogated. I don't know if we'd call this so much a romance as a weird sexy monster moment, but it's definitely notable enough to receive a mention. Here Venom is bonded with Matt Gargan, Hawkeye is naked, and Venom is seen licking him from behind and very loosely and suggestively choking him while Norman asks him where the other true Avengers are hiding out. It's all very sensual in a way that is odd and to me definitely implies Venom or Mac or some combination basically consider Hawkeye to be a hottie. That's how it's made to look anyways. I can't blame them though. I feel like Clint Burton is definitely a hottie, so yeah. Number 9. Flash Thompson and Valkyrie This was a relationship that happened during the Secret Avengers when Flash Thompson as Agent Venom was on the team. I know I said I'd be focusing on Eddie Brock and Venom relationships, but this one also technically involves Venom through Flash and is too weird for me to just not include. Also, Flash was Agent Venom for quite a while in the comics, so I feel like we can just definitely count him in. This relationship was more strange because it was just so out of the blue. I don't have anything against it, but even Valkyrie Brunhilde acknowledged the awkwardness and decided to take matters into her own hands by basically jumping Flash Thompson's bones. It was a strange, secret relationship, but I guess, what do you expect on the Secret Avengers? Seems oddly fitting, if not a bit abrupt. Alright friends, before we move on to that next point, it's that part of the video where I do the YouTube thing and I say, hey, click this like because it helps us. But seriously, click this like because it helps us. Number 8. Venom and Mary Jane. Another strange romance for sure. Venom basically left MJ traumatized when the two first met to the point that she was terrified of them and has had various disturbing experiences with them throughout her history. And yet. This is comics, and histories are long, so pretty much anyone can end up with anyone. Also, this is MJ, and I feel like everyone just wants to ship her with everyone because, I mean, MJ's a hottie, so yeah. These two haven't gotten romantic in the traditional sense, but there have been a few moments where Venom has seemingly pined for Mary Jane, resenting the fact that Eddie always seems to get the girl, despite the fact that he is usually the one messing up those relationships. Which is very strange, especially considering how much Venom seems to pine for Eddie, but anyways. Once again, Venom is definitely a jealous creature by nature, which we've seen time and time again in the comics. We have also seen the symbiote bond with Mary Jane, much to her own chagrin, and despite the likely conflicted feelings of MJ fans at this happening. But yeah, it's a weird and problematic thing. And it's there. So let's just acknowledge it. Number 7, Eddie Brock and Liz Allen. A romance that never really amounted to anything other than Eddie trying to make a move on Liz, who pretty much just always rejects him. This attempt at a romance was made even weirder too when Venom revealed their jealousy of Liz, although I get it, they want Eddie all to themselves. Why bother with Liz when Eddie has a perfectly good romantic partner in Venom? The whole thing is pretty weird though, Venom feeling the need to compete with Liz for Eddie's attention, when really, who has more of Eddie's time than Venom themselves. They basically like have a monopoly on it. They spend most of their time bonded to the guy, but the whole exchange here is made even more strange by the fact that Liz doesn't really reciprocate Eddie's romantic interest to begin with. So there isn't that much even for Venom to be jealous of, other than I guess Eddie's wandering eye. Venom's like, Eddie, I see your eyes wandering and just look at me. Just look at your symbiote. Look at yourself in the mirror, basically. Number six, Venom and Spider-Man. One of the greatest unrequited love stories of all time. Poor Venom just wanted to bond with Spider-Man, but Spider-Man was having none of it. This was truly a rough time for the symbiote who just 
was getting rejected left, right, and center until he fell into the lap of Eddie Brock, who seemed to also share his hatred for Spider Man, and the two basically encouraged a sense of hate and kind of rage in one another initially because of this negative experience that Venom had originally with Peter Parker. If you don't believe me that this was a romance of sorts, just look at the name of the issue where the two kind of break up more permanently in Web of Spider Man. The name of the story where the suit attempts to once more bond to Peter unsuccessfully, who shakes it off with the sonic disruptance of some loud bells ringing, is called Till Death Do Us Part. Sounds pretty romantic to me. Definitely some strange, sad, and unrequited love there. Poor Venom, they're always being rejected by Spider Man continuously. Number five. Venom and Lee Price. Lee Price really messed up Venom. Their relationship was weird in the worst of ways. Venom bonded to Lee when it was desperate for a host, but Lee ended up taking control of the symbiote and using it to do all kinds of terrible things and kill people. Not that the symbiote hadn't killed people before, I mean it had, but the huge difference here was this was very much against Venom's will, and Price would often use it to target people regardless of their alignment, which Venom has always been conflicted about. While with Eddie, it was against hurting innocence for the most part. But Lee didn't care about what Venom wanted or its feelings. Basically, this relationship between Price and Venom, while not inherently romantic explicitly, was meant to symbolize the most toxic kind of romantic relationship. An abusive one. Number four, Venom and Beck Underwood. This one was pretty weird because Beck seemed to be super into it at first. Well, I mean, for a time, anyways. Like most people, she ended up ultimately being turned off by the whole combo deal of Venom and Eddie Brock together. In the end, the whole dating of both the symbiote and Eddie ended up just being too much for her. It got pretty strange, too, when Beck asked Eddie about his relationship with the suit and wanted to make sure it was healthy. One of the things that I actually didn't really like about her was how she got kind of a bit judgy when she felt the need to seek clarity on if Eddie was really enamored with Venom because he just hadn't found an adequate and committed woman to settle down with. Let Eddie love his alien suit, I say. Just let it happen. But I totally understand that it can be a lot for someone to get involved with both Eddie Brock and, you know, the alien that is Venom. That's a lot. In the end, the two ended up parting on amicable terms, with Beck giving both Eddie and Venom one last kiss and hug. And Venom was also super heartbroken about it. They were like, no, please don't leave us. Number three, Eddie Brock and Ashley Kafka. This one comes to us not from the comics, but instead from the Spider-Man animated series out of the 90s. Here, Dr. Ashley Kafka was the person treating Eddie Brock during his time at Ravencroft Institute for the Criminally Insane. Eddie insisted that he was Venom, but Dr. Kafka believed that he was just delusional and that stress had basically caused him to lash out and to believe that he was the villain Venom when he actually wasn't. This relationship was weird on the premise that it was a patient and doctor relationship turned romance, and the fact that both fell in love with one another while Ashley kind of thought Eddie was imagining being Venom and was at the time insane. So. Yeah. It got even weirder when Carnage got involved and caused a bunch of chaos that caused Eddie to save the day once reunited with the Venom symbiote. In the end, they were unable to be together as Venom got sucked into a magical portal in order to save Ashley. Don't you just hate it when a magical portal and multiple villains prevent you from being with the one you love? <sighs> I know I do. Number two, Eddie Brock and Anne Wang. And Venom? This relationship basically got super weird in a bad way for Anne when Venom got involved. Anne and Eddie were originally married, but after Eddie lost his dad and his job, Anne couldn't take sort of the dark path that he was headed down and left him. This of course only put Eddie in an even darker place, and then he found the Venom symbiote. Together, their combined hatred for Spider-Man turned them into a villain, but Eddie still longed for Anne and wanted to make things right. They kind of ended up back together for a bit, but this also made things worse for Anne, who was left traumatized and feeling violated after bonding with Venom herself. She didn't like the person that she and the symbiote were together, she Venom, nor what it did to Eddie. And it was all this trauma that actually caused Anne to be unable to leave her apartment for months, and later resulted in her taking her own life after Eddie and Venom confronted her once more and were super clueless when it came to just how fragile Anne's emotional and mental state was at the time. Because Spider-Man was also present at the time and also freaking Anne out though, Eddie of course continued to blame him for his problems and for the death of his ex-wife. Number 1. Simbrock This is really the love story for the ages, but 
is also one of the strangest ones out there. Eddie falling in love with a symbiotic alien suit who it turns out is its own living entity and vice versa. This is confirmed in the comics as the two have expressed their love for one another and even at times bickered like a married couple. They also call each other things like love and dear so. Yeah, that's, that's pretty coupley in my opinion. Not only that, but Eddie has helped Venom deliver children, even though those children are technically kinda just Venoms who reproduces asexually. But still, Venom considered Eddie to basically be the father of their children, so yeah. And also, Eddie helped the symbiote to deliver, in essence, their symbiote child together, Sleeper, bonding with Venom while it was, in essence, giving birth. This labor was a hard one, and Eddie bonded with Venom to help it through and to help stabilize his partner, not just in this labor, but also in heroics, crime, and in a way, love. Aside from this moment, we have seen tons of other moments where the pair chose to be together and support one another in a pretty intimate way. At the end of the day, these two together are one of the weirdest and sweetest romances on this list. Mm -hmm.